Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lydia Mashburn, Policy Director for Chairman Ron Paul's Subcommittee on Domestic Monetary Policy. Uh, on behalf of the Congressman in his office, I'd like to thank you all from, for coming to our concluding lecture in our afternoon tea series on the basic principles of money. Uh, today's question is going to be, what about money causes economic crises? It's sort of the um, culmination of what our other lectures have led to. Our first lecture was, what is money? And then our second one was, what is constitutional money? Uh, in those two lectures, our first lecture, Dr. Salerno very nicely laid out for us what money is, that money is a commodity. It is a market-chosen commodity that serves the role of money. And what the market needs money to do is it needs it to be recognizable. They need to know that this is the same thing, that they're able to trade in future. They need to be able to divide it so that they can purchase large or small things. They need it to be portable. They need to take it with them. Cattle as money didn't work out very well because it's a little difficult to move them from one place to another. Um, and then one of the pinnacle uh, faculties of money is that it has a stable value. You need it to maintain the value for which you exchanged it for. Um, which then brought us to our second lecture where Dr. Vieira talked to us about constitutional money. Uh, the Founding Fathers wanted us to understand or wanted us to keep stable money. Um, and it had turned out that the market had chosen gold and silver to fulfill money because it filled all those other properties of divisibility, portability, rec uh, recognition, and stable value. So they set up in the Constitution uh, certain provisions to maintain what the market had chosen as money because they had already experienced through the Revolutionary War and uh, then under the Articles of Confederation, some uh, terrible experiments with paper money where it did not retain its value because you could increase it at whim. Um, Dr. Vieira sort of took us through, I think roughly 200 years or more of history and showed how over time that stable value of money has eroded uh, legally and got us to the point where we are today, where we are now able to talk about what happens when your money loses its value. So while it's terrible that over time your money does lose its value, what's even worse, or I don't know if it's even worse, but it's not good, is that it also can cause booms and busts in an economy. It causes economic crises. And that's what brings us to today's question. What about money causes economic crises? Uh, which is why I'm delighted to say that we have Peter Schiff to answer this question for us. Uh, he's, he's CEO and president of Euro Pacific Capital. He's a financial analyst. He's an author. I think most importantly, though, at least to me, is he was one of the few financial analysts to predict the collapse of the housing bubble. Everyone else was like, housing prices have gone up. They just keep going up. It's never historically dropped. And he said, look, it's it's going to collapse because it's not sustainable because he understood what it was about money that caused these bubbles in the economy and he knew it was going to collapse. Uh, analysts running the gambit laughed at his face and when he was proven correct, we're now left picking up the pieces. But unfortunately, we still are not understanding what it is that caused the crisis to begin with. So our policy prescriptions are kind of off base in terms of dealing with the aftermath. So I'm delighted to welcome, and I hope you will join me in welcoming, Peter Schiff. Right, thanks everybody for coming. Hopefully most of you are not here for the free desserts. But all right, let me talk a little bit about money. I'm going to turn my phone off just in, just in case somebody decides to call me. I'll just put it on silent. Anyway, everybody else, I guess, can do the same thing. Yeah, what are, what are the, one of the uh, roles of uh, money, as you just alluded to, is that money needs to represent a store of value. And the reason that that's so important is because that facilitates savings. Right? You're not going to save money if you anticipate that its value is going to erode over time. Uh, so you need something that has a store of value. And the reason savings are so important in a, in a market economy is because contrary to the conventional wisdom, spending is not what grows the economy. 
people who believe that are basically putting the cart before the horse. What actually grows an economy is the opposite of spending. It's underconsumption, it's savings, it's the money we don't spend that makes the economy grow. Because when we don't spend it and it's saved, that money is available to finance capital investments, business expansion, job creation, all the things that grow the economy flow through from savings. You know, a popular refrain, you know, the Occupy Wall Street crowd, when they say, you know, we, the businesses don't create ta jobs, you know, when you say we can tax the job creators, they say, no, 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 the job creators are the consumers because they're the ones that are spending the money. And they say, well, if there were no customers, then there would be no businesses. But of course, what that theory overlooks is where do the consumers get the money? Right? They get it from their jobs. So you can't say that consumers create jobs when you need jobs to have consumers. So it's the other way around. And what gives the consumer purchasing power is his productivity. Right? If everybody just had a job from the government and the government printed money and gave it to people, that wouldn't, you know, there'd be no demand because there'd be no supply. There'd be nothing to buy because nobody would be working. What creates the purchasing power is the production. And the production comes from productivity. And what makes workers productive is capital. It's the tools and the equipment that they have. If they were simply using their hands, uh, they couldn't produce nearly as much. And all of that capital, all of those tools are only here because of savings. So savings are very important. And also, savings help determine the rate of interest. Because interest rates are a very important aspect of money. Because interest rates represent a price. And like all prices, they are determined by supply and demand. The supply is all the savings. The demand is all the people that want to borrow money, whether it's businesses, whether it's college students, uh, someone wants to buy a car, uh, the government. Everybody borrowing money is competing for this store of savings. Because for every money dollar borrowed, somebody had to save that dollar. Somebody had to not consume and, and, and put that dollar in savings so that somebody else could, could spend it or invest it. And so if you have a lot of savings, right, then you're going to have lower interest rates because the supply is going to be greater. And what does that mean? If there's a lot of savings, what economic signals is that sending to the market? If people are saving a lot of money, what that says is that people prefer future consumption to current consumption. Because after all, when you're saving money, you're just deferring consumption. Every dollar you save is going to be spent eventually, except you're not going to spend it today. You want to spend it tomorrow. And hopefully you'll spend the dollar tomorrow plus all the interest that you earned over time. And, and so it sends out signals that there's, if there's a lot of savings, that there's low interest rates. And then, of course, the economy will react. Investments will be made based on the fact that consumption has been deferred to the future. And also, you know, one of the reasons that people might save in a free market economy is in a free market economy, contrary to, again, the conventional wisdom, prices go down. Right? The natural tendency in a free market is deflation. Prices go down. Prices went down uh, for almost the entire history of the United States until the Federal Reserve. You know, our grandparents will tell us stories about how cheap things were when they were a kid. Well, their grandparents or their grandparents' grandparents told the opposite stories, how expensive things were when they were a kid and how much cheaper they are now. And the politicians try to tell us that, no, no, inflation is a good thing. Uh, money losing value is a good thing because the economy would collapse if prices weren't rising. They try to make us feel that falling prices uh, would be a, a disaster when, of course, it's the opposite. Falling prices uh, are a reward for capitalism. They make wages more valuable. They make savings more valuable. You know, the, the, the argument is that, well, if prices are falling, nobody is going to buy anything. They'll just be waiting for lower prices. And of course, that's absurd. We all have cell phones. You know, we all have a, laptop computers, we all have plasma TVs, the prices for those items are falling all the time. That doesn't stop people from buying them. In fact, it encourages people to buy them. If cell phones were still as expensive as they were when they first came out, nobody in this room would have one. The reason that we buy them is because the prices are coming down. So it's the exact opposite. Falling prices create demand. It's not the other way around. But that's another reason that people save. If you save your money and money gains value, you can buy more stuff in the future, not only because you earned interest, but because things got cheaper, the money became more valuable. So if you have a lot of savings, you can have low interest rates. If you don't have a lot of savings, well, you're going to have high interest rates. And the beauty of this is, let's assume that there's not a lot of people saving money and a lot of people want to borrow money. 
Well, you have a very limited supply. Uh, you have a lot of demand. What happens to price? Price goes up, so interest rates go up. Higher interest rates discourage people from borrowing because it's more expensive, and they encourage people to save. And ultimately, the market's going to create an equilibrium between savings and, and debt, and you're going to have a market rate of interest. And investments are going to be made, capital projects are going to be made that can be adequately financed. Now, the problem comes in, now that we don't have real money, and you don't know what that is, now that we have fiat money or a money substitute, uh, the Fed can create money out of thin air. Now, when they create money, they don't actually create any value. It's just, they're just printing money. So they diminish the, the, the value of the money that already exists. But also, when the Fed creates money, they do it in a way where they, they buy up treasuries. And they also control short-term interest rates, rates, the cost of money to banks. And when they do that, the Federal Reserve can bring down interest rates. And that has the effect of sending the same types of signals to the market that there's more savings. Because interest rates are low. But people aren't saving their money. There is no real change in, in, in time preference for money. It's the same. And so you send out this false economic signal to the market. And, and, and as a result of that false economic signal, a lot of investments are made that really should not be made. There's no real viability there. Uh, but they're made because of these the false signals. And I often joke, you know, when the um, uh, housing bubble burst, and one of the things that President Bush said at the time was he blamed everything on Wall Street. He said, you know, Wall Street, Wall Street was drunk, and they did a bunch of stupid things. So of course, yeah, they were drunk, but he never asked the question, why? You know, where'd they get all that alcohol? Why were they drunk? And they were drunk because the Fed liquored them up. I mean, Alan Greenspan kept interest rates very, very low for a long period of time. And just like anybody, you know, if you're drunk, you know, you're going to do some stupid things while you're drunk. You don't realize it until you sober up the following morning, you know, that you, you know. Um, and, and so this is what causes this business cycle, right? People think that the business cycle is just some flaw in capitalism. Just for some reason, you know, you, we have these booms and busts. And that's not the case. These booms are caused by the malinvestments that are created in response to the Fed uh, intervening uh, in money supply, where you have the Fed price fixing interest rates, creating too much money and, and fueling these bubbles. And one thing all of these bubbles have in common is debt. A lot of them are financed by borrowing money, particularly the housing market. I mean, obviously, what made it possible for people to buy houses they couldn't afford, other than Freddie and Fannie or the FHA that might have been you know, guaranteeing the mortgages, was the fact that the interest rates were so low. When people buy houses in America, they buy them based on the monthly payment. And the monthly payments were a function of the, the mortgage rate. And especially when you got an interest-only mortgage, where the only thing you're paying is the interest, then the low interest rates really made it cheaper. And when you had the Fed with interest rates at 1% and the banks were offering teaser rates based on those temporarily low interest rates, people could really get in over their head. So this was a function of money being too cheap. Instead of the market setting interest rates, you had central government planners at the Fed picking an interest rate. And why did they pick one that was so low? Well, the reason is the politicians like the boom. Right? They like it when people feel good, when voters feel good, because they're more likely to reelect the people who are in office if they feel good. If they think they're getting rich in housing, if they think they can get rich without working, they're going to be happy, especially if you're taxing them so much on what they earn. If you can create the illusion that they're making money in the real estate market, well, then they're not going to be as upset at all the taxes they have to pay. So the politicians like the boom. In fact, everybody thinks that the boom is what's good. And then when the minute you have a recession, what, is, what does Congress want to do? What does the president want to do? We need a stimulus. We can't have this recession. We need to stimulate the economy. Well, they don't understand it. The stimulus is why we have a recession. Right? The stimulus is what caused the boom. But the boom is the problem. The boom is where all the mistakes are made. The recession is where the mistakes are corrected. Right? That's where the cure takes place. So we, we need the recession. Now, when people say we need the recession, they'll try to say, oh, you're heartless. You, 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 you're happy that people are suffering. No, that doesn't mean we're happy about it. It just means it's necessary. 
It's like if somebody uh, checks into rehab uh, because they're a, a drug addict and then they're going through withdrawal, that doesn't mean that the rehab center is happy that the people are suffering through withdrawal. They just know that if they want to get healthy and kick the habit, that they're going to go through withdrawal. That's just part of the cure. You know, if when you checked into rehab, every time you started having withdrawal symptoms, they gave you drugs, right? You're not going to get cured. You might be popular. You might be a popular rehab center if you're giving out drugs to everybody, <laughs> but not because you're curing anybody. And so what happens is the minute the, the, uh, the narcotic of the cheap money begins to wear off, right? And we realize the mistakes that we made. People are like, you know, I, I can't believe I bought that condo. You know, I can't believe, you know, how do I buy that internet stock? You, you don't see this when it's the mania, but the interest rates eventually rise and the mistakes. And so what happens during the recession is the market tries to correct all these imbalances because during the boom, resources are misallocated. Capital, labor, right, is, is misallocated. In the housing bubble, right, too much capital went into building homes, remodeling homes. Uh, too many people were buying all sorts of furnishings for their homes, buying cars based on home equity loans. Too many people were working in the mortgage industry, in the finance industry. There were, you know, people had jobs where they shouldn't have gone. Because the whole idea behind an economy is to allocate the resources, which include labor, but capital and land, in a way to maximize uh, productivity, to maximize uh, our enjoyment and our utility from, you know, from uh, these resources so that we can have a rising standard of living. But if capital and labor and land are, are, are where they're not supposed to be, right, that you have to correct that. And what does that mean? What happens when the bubble bursts? Well, people that made bad investments lose money. People that have jobs that they shouldn't have, you know, they have to lose those jobs so they can get other jobs. You see, a, a lot of times in, uh, in Washington, people don't differentiate between jobs. They just think as long as people have a job, it's okay, right? If somebody has a job digging a ditch and someone else has a job filling it back up, as far as Washington is concerned, they're both employed. But they're employed doing what? What do you have to show for the labor? Nothing. You know, you filled the hole in the ground. You have exactly what you had before they started. It is, we don't want jobs because we want jobs. Jobs are not an ends. Jobs are a means. What people want when they have a job is they want all the things that they can buy with their paychecks. But you can only buy stuff if something, if something is produced. So people have to be employed productively. That's the key. You know, in the old Soviet Union, you know, before it collapsed, one of the things they used to brag about is that they had no unemployment. They would tell their citizens, look at these Americans, they have all this unemployment, but nobody in Russia is unemployed. Of course, yeah, everybody worked for the government. Everybody had a job. But, you know, they had to wait in line for six hours to buy some bread or whatever, they, because nobody was baking bread. Everybody was working for the government. And so if no one is producing anything, then your salary doesn't have any value, because that's just money. You can print money all you want. You know, that's not the solution. I mean, a lot of people now talk about the fact that we don't have enough demand. You hear all the Keynesians are saying that the problem with the economy is that Americans are broke, they have big mortgage debt, they have car loans, they have student loans, so they don't have any money, and so the government needs to print money so we can have more spending. Right? But you know, if you're broke, just adding money isn't going to change the circumstances, because money in and of itself doesn't have any value at all. It's just a little piece of paper. You know, they're broke because they're loaded up with debt and they're not productive. And more money isn't going to change that. Or if the government, they'll say, well, the people are broke, so the government has to spend. Spend what? If the people are broke, the government is broke. Where does the government get the money? It doesn't get it from the moon. You know, it gets it from the people. So if the people are too broke to spend, the government's too broke to spend. Because the government has to, has to tax them to get the money. But one of the problems with the monetary system we have now is that people think, well, we don't have to tax them to get money. We could just, we could just print it. And then we can spend that as if there are no adverse consequences to pretty money. Because that's a tax, just like anything else, except instead of taking your money away from you, what that does is take the purchasing power away from your money. So you don't, you don't necessarily see the tax, but you feel the tax. But you know, when you go to the supermarket and groceries are more expensive, or you go to the gas station and gasoline costs more money, a lot of people don't make the connection. They don't see that that's a tax. 
especially when you have the government or the, or the economists blaming the high prices on a greedy oil company or on OPEC or on natural disasters, on bad weather, on a flood. So they say, oh, it's not the government's fault. You know? And then you'll have the economists say, look, it's a good thing that the prices are going up because otherwise we might have deflation. You know, so this is, you know, this is the price that you have to pay to avoid deflation is you've got to pay higher prices. So they don't make the connection. So it lets the politicians off the hook because the public doesn't understand how all these benefits are being financed. Now, the, the other source of this big bubble or this big problem has to do with the US dollar's role as the world's reserve currency. You know, up until the, uh, the Second World War, all the countries were using gold. Everybody was on a gold standard, including the United States. And after the Second World War, we pretty much, America pretty much had almost all the world's gold. 90% or more than 90% of the world's gold was held by the US government. And where did we get all that gold? I mean, we didn't mine it all. We got it because people used it to buy the products that we produced. And where, how, do, how did we produce all these products? We produced them because we were the freest country in the world. We had more capitalism and more freedom, and as a result, we were more productive. And the world wanted the stuff that we produced, yet they weren't productive enough to produce stuff for us, so they had to give us their gold. So we had all this gold. And we went around to all the other countries and basically proposed a new monetary system. And this was going to be where, instead of foreign central banks backing up their currencies with gold, they would back them up with a dollar. And the dollar, though, was backed up by gold. Of course, that's the only reason it made sense. If the dollar was backed by nothing, then we couldn't have conned the world into, into signing up for this arrangement. But everybody knew the dollar was as good as gold. And if you had $35, you'd get one ounce of gold. That was the deal we made with the world. And what was in it for the world was if they held dollars, they got interest. If they held gold, they had storage costs. So it made sense. Hold the dollars. We're on a dollar standard. The dollar is the reserve currency. The dollar is backed by gold. America is the world's richest country. They have the biggest trade surplus. They're the world's biggest creditor nation. They've got all the gold. Good deal. Well, it was a great deal for us because the minute we got that privilege, we abused it. Because now all of a sudden, we could pay for our imports by printing money. Now, technically, we were supposed to have the gold to back it up, but that didn't stop the government. They just, they just lied, right? They just wrote, they wrote checks that they couldn't really cash, assuming that people would just not care or not notice. Well, after the 1960s, when we had you know, the guns and butter economy, the war on poverty, the great society, we went to the moon, uh, you know, Vietnam, all this stuff, we were running big deficits. And some of our creditors began to notice this and, and, and realize that you know, we couldn't possibly have enough gold to back up these IOUs, which is what the Federal Reserve notes were. They were promises to pay real money. The real money was the gold that the Fed had it, you know, in its, in, in its uh, vaults. So rather than acting responsibly, rather than uh, devaluing the dollar and allowing a deflation to occur um, and cutting government spending and, 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 and doing the right thing, the politicians did the expedient thing, but almost an unthinkable thing, and they defaulted. Nixon basically told our creditors, we promised to give you gold for your, for your Federal Reserve notes. We're now going to give you nothing. You know, you can hold on to them if you want, but you're not going to get any gold. And, you know, the, the world should have gone back on a gold standard at that point, right? But they didn't. Now, they marked the dollar down rather dramatically. The dollar was marked down by about two-thirds during the 1970s. The Deutsche Mark, you know, when the 1970s began, you can buy four Deutsche Marks for the dollar. At the end, you can get about a, one and a half. The Swiss franc went from like 23 cents to 75 cents. Uh, the yen used to get 360 yen of the dollar. Later in the decade, it was down to like 150. Of course, you know, it's a lot no, lower now, but that was a big drop during the 1970s. Oil prices went from $3 a barrel to $30 a barrel. I mean, that's why oil prices went up. It wasn't because of the Arabs. It was because of Nixon. It was because of uh, what the government did. It was all the money we printed. Money lost value. Oil prices didn't go up at all. Uh, but in, in terms of de, de, you know, a depreciated dollar, oil went from $3 a barrel to $30 a barrel. And um, you know, gold prices went up from 35 up to over 800 Another thing happened, too, during the 1970s. A lot of women came into the workforce. And it wasn't because of, they were liberated. In fact, they were liberated before. But as a result of all this inflation and all these taxes, 
their husbands could no longer afford to support them. So they had to, they had to start working. You know, our standard of living declined dramatically with the loss of the purchasing power of the dollar. And in fact, you know, I mentioned that oil I often use as an example. I think I even used it in that congressional testimony when people say, oh, you know, oil gasoline prices are so high now, we're paying almost four dollars a gallon. These are, you know, record high prices. I say they're not. They're actually lower than they were in the 1950s. Well, how, what do you mean they're lower? Well, you know, if, if back in the 1950s, you, know, you could buy a gallon of gasoline for a quarter. It's all it costs, 25 cents. Well, if you, know, if you have a 1957 Chevy and you scoop around in the, in the seat cushions and you find a quarter that was dropped there in 1957, you can still buy a gallon of gas with that quarter. You get change, too, because it doesn't cost that much. It costs less because real money held its value. The only reason that oil is more expensive is because we're paying for it with depreciated dollars. That, um, that is a problem. Before I, what was I talking about before I started talking about that? I just lost my train of thought. Standard of living. Yeah, well, OK, so the standard of living went, went down dramatically after the 1970s. But even though the world marked down the dollar, after it collapsed, it stabilized. It stabilized when Paul Volcker came in and interest rates went up to 20%. Ronald Reagan came in promising to reduce government and lower regulations and cut government spending. And that created some confidence uh, in the dollar. And it kind of stopped the hemorrhaging. And the world then began to continue to function. The dollar was still the reserve currency, even though it was backed by nothing. And that is the problem. Because the whole idea is if the Deutschmark wasn't backed by gold, it was backed by the dollar that was backed by gold. But if the Deutschmark is backed by the dollar and the dollar is backed by nothing, then the Deutschmark is backed by nothing. So that's when basically we, 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 we you know, embarked on this giant uh, experiment that has failed every time it's ever been tried in, in fiat money. The whole world is on this fiat money system. But of course, once the world knew the dollar was backed by nothing, now it was so much easier for the government to run deficits. It, much easier than when they had to pretend it was backed by gold. At least back then, you know, when Lyndon Johnson was doing this, he had a worry that somebody might figure out what was going on. But once we basically told the world, you're going to get nothing for your dollars, then there was no limit to how many we could print. And that's when the US economy began this massive transformation from the world's biggest creditor to the world's biggest debtor, uh, from the world's you know, you know, best, you know, biggest manufacturer of low cost, high quality stuff. I mean, all the low cost merchandise was made in America. Everything. Even, even, uh, even though we paid the highest wages in the world. Right? If something was expensive, if something was imported, that meant it was expensive. People used to brag about the fact that they can afford to buy imports. If you bought imported products, it meant you were rich because everything that was imported was, was, was expensive. All the bargain basement stuff was made here. And it wasn't because we had low labor costs. We had the highest labor costs in the world. But our workers were the most productive because they had the most capital. They had the most tools and the most equipment. And our businesses had the fewest regulations. So it was, a free, it was freedom that made us uh, prosperous. But all that changed, and we began to live off the printing press. Because when the dollar can be just printed out of thin air and the world is going to take it, we can buy all these products from our trading partners for nothing. You know, when the Chinese are making uh, things for Americans, they need land, labor, and capital. People have to work hard in factories to produce stuff. What do we give them in return? Just some money that we ran off a printing press. And what do they do with it? Nothing. They can't. They can't even spend it. All they can do with it is loan it back to us and buy treasuries. And then what, you know, what, are, what are treasuries? Just more dollars. And you know, a lot of people, again, they confuse, they, they confuse this. They think that the Chinese are benefiting from this relationship. They're not, they're not gaining at all. We're benefiting, right? They get, we get all the stuff and they get all the work. Well, what good is the work without the stuff? See, we're trying to say, well, they get jobs. Well, so what? The slaves had jobs. Wasn't a good deal for the slaves. You know, these jobs are not a good deal for the Chinese if we get all the stuff that they produce, right? They're working. The whole, the whole idea behind exporting is not to create jobs. It's really to eliminate jobs. I mean, the reason you export is to import something else, right? Because you want to consume. And how do you consume as much as possible? Well, if there's something that you can do really well, that you can make more efficiently than somebody else, rather than try to make everything, you just make the things you make best, and then you trade for the things that other people make better than you. But the whole reason to export something is so you want to buy something else. You don't export just so you can have a job. 
That's what you're just wasting your labor. Now, what happens when we trade with the rest of the world, they send us stuff. And what we basically say is, you know, well, I got nothing for you. But, we, you know, I got an IOU, you know, you, dollars. You know, we take the IOU and they take it because it's the reserve currency. And maybe in the back of their mind or I guess in the front of their mind, they figure that one day they can use it to buy something. But meanwhile, what are they going to buy? What are we making? Every year we make less and less stuff that they want. The stuff that the Chinese want to buy is all made in China. I mean, that's where the stuff that we want to buy is. And, but they, they, this, is, this whole thing is maintained. But now we have this entire bubble. We have this entire phony economy that is now predicated on Americans borrowing money that they didn't save to buy products that they can't afford and didn't make. And this whole thing is phony. And all of our, all of our economic policy is designed to sustain this. Nobody wants to allow it to be corrected because the correction happens in a recession. We have a lot of problems. The biggest problem in the US economy is that interest rates are too low. Interest rates have to go up. We're never going to have a recovery. We're never going to have real economic growth. We're never going to create productive jobs unless interest rates go up. But that's going to be very painful because we're so overly indebted. What's going to happen when interest rates go up? Well, banks are going to fail. And they're not going to be able to, they, that next time we can't bail them out. What's going to happen to the housing market? going to go down more. It needs to go down more. That's part of the correction. Prices were too high. They're still too high. What about the government? What's going to happen when interest rates go up? Well, the government is going to have to dramatically reduce spending. In fact, they might have to default on the, on the bonds they've already sold. Because the, the only reason the government can pay the interest on the debt is because the rates are really, really low. Well, what happens when rates go up? Well, they, they can't afford it. We can no, longer, no more afford to pay our, bond, our bonds back than the Greeks can. You know, for a while, interest rates in Greece were at record lows, and the Greeks had no problem. But then interest rates went up, and now you have a crisis. The same thing is going to happen here. Now, there are people that think, well, that'll never happen because interest rates are never going to rise. Well, that's just impossible. They have to rise. You know, what is the consequence of keeping interest rates artificially low? We continue to screw up our economy. Instead of allowing market forces to correct the imbalances, we make the imbalances bigger. Right? The more we stimulate the economy with the toxin, because that's what the stimulus is, it's a, it's, it's a toxic sedative, and eventually you overdose on it. Right? What is happening? If we keep interest rates low, nobody is going to save. I mean, who's going to save money that's depreciating in value? Right? So you're going to destroy your savings. You're going to destroy the ability of the economy to generate capital, to generate growth or, or production. You're going to create massive inflation. Now, the government can lie about inflation for a while. They can hide it behind these doctored up uh, CPI numbers that are so, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, mechanized or they, they're so manipulated. Not, you know, there's a conspiracy, but the formulas that they use to calculate uh, prices going up are flawed. They're deliberately engineered to get a low number. I mean, that's how, why they're there. But of course, when they're measuring prices, they're not even measuring inflation, they're measuring an effect of inflation. But at some point, the inflation is going to be so pronounced that it's, and its effect on prices is going to be so great that the government is not going to be able to pretend that it doesn't exist. And then at that point, interest rates are really going to have to rise. And then it's all going to hit the fan. And as I said, that's when the banks are going to fail. And you know, the next time the banks fail, if the Fed is doing the right thing and raising rates, that means not only do the banks fail, not only do the bondholders lose money, but the depositors lose money. Because if the government is having you know, trouble paying its own debts, how's it going to bail out the FDIC? You know, where's it going to get that money? It's this, so there are tremendous losses. All, all we're doing now, all of our policy is designed to postpone the day of reckoning beyond the next election. That's all Congress cares about. How can we get through 2012 without it you know, hitting the fan? And, and they don't care that the policies that they're pursuing are just making all the problems worse. And when we look at the economy and people say, oh, the economy is growing. Look at the GDP. The economy's not growing. We're spending more borrowed money. That's not economic growth. Look at the debt. In the last few years, right, since Obama's been president, look how much the debt has skyrocketed. It's grown by much more than the GDP. So all this consumption has been financed with debt. It's not real prosperity. It's phony. It's like, it's like take, looking at half of a balance sheet. You're looking at the assets and you're ignoring all the liabilities. Or on, on, a, on an income statement, you look at the income, but you don't look at the expenses. We are not better off because the GDP went up. We're worse off. Where'd that money come from? We borrowed it. And what did we do with it? We spent it on consumption. 
We didn't invest it. We don't have more plant and equipment. We blew it. Right? We, the government spent it. You know, the bubble that we had as a result of the cheap money uh, that the Fed created in the 1990s, that inflated a stock market bubble. When that bubble burst, instead of letting the market correct the problem, we deliberately gave us more stimulus, and that created the housing bubble. When that bubble burst, instead of, again, sucking it up, admitting that, gee, we really screwed up after the last bubble, let's do the right thing now, let's let the market run its course, instead of doing that and taking a more painful recession, which was now necessary because they, we didn't take our medicine uh, the first time, they did the same mistake, and now they're inflating a government bubble. The government bubble is bigger than a housing bubble. It is bigger than the, uh, the stock market bubble. You know? And it's going to burst. It's no more sustainable than, uh, than the previous bubbles. And you can see it in the bond market. You can see it in the currency market. But the real crisis that's coming, and then I know we, I've been talking, we'll take questions. The real crisis that's coming as a result of, of the fact that we no longer have sound money, that we've been printing all this money and running all these huge uh, imbalances, is a sovereign debt crisis, a collapse in the US government bond market, a collapse in the dollar on a much grander scale than what we see playing out right now in Europe. And if you remember, when the housing bubble first began to crack and the signs showed up first in the subprime market, all the experts, everybody you know, from the administration down to Wall Street was on television reassuring everybody not to worry that it was all contained. It was just a subprime problem, tiny little problem, don't worry about it, the market is sound. Of course, at the time I was saying that that's not true. It's not a subprime problem, it was a mortgage problem that we were just seeing the symptoms first in subprime, but the symptoms were there. And it wasn't even about contagion, about spreading. Everybody was already sick. It was just a question of time before the symptoms showed up. Well, the same thing that's happening with sovereigns. This is not an Italian problem or a Greek problem or an Irish problem. It's a, it's a debt problem. And we've got more debt than Europe. Just because we can print money and we have the world's reserve currency doesn't mean that we're immune from these laws. Right now, I think, is when this is the time in history where the sovereigns are being held accountable. You know, just like the Italians or the Greeks have borrowed more money than uh, their citizens can repay, American, American government has borrowed more money than Americans can possibly repay. And, you know, we're not going to pay these, the debts off by raising taxes on the 1%. Yeah, I mean, we can't even do it by raising taxes on the 99%, as if we can even extract all that revenue. You know, it's going to have to come through a restructuring. It's going to have to come through a default one way or another. And there's two ways that that can happen. We can legitimately default. We can, we can, Congress can level with its creditors and say, look, we're not going to pay 100 cents on the dollar on these treasuries. It can level with uh, people who are expect, expecting a government pension or a Social Security check and level with them and say, look, the money's not there. We can't pay you everything that we promised. And we'll come up with some way of means testing it or doing something so that we can make do with less or they're going to inflate the currency into oblivion. And it won't just be not worth a continental, it'll be not worth a Federal Reserve note. Because one way or another, the people who loan money to Americans are, are going to lose. The, the, the savers are going to lose, the creditors are going to lose. Either they're not going to get their money back, or the money they get back isn't going to have much value. But the problem is, the longer we wait, the worse it's going to be for everybody, and the more damage that we do to our underlying economy. Because the longer we allow these malinvestments to build up, right, the bigger the impact when they collapse, and the harder it is to restore balance. And part of that would be going back to sound money, going back to a gold standard. I'm confident that the world is going to go back on a gold standard. The question is, how much longer is it going to take? And how high is the price of gold going to be when that happens? But if we go back on a gold standard, then we will have discipline again um, in Congress, because Congress won't be able to spend money unless they can extract it from the taxpayer. They're not going to just be able to print money. We're not going to be able to run all these trade deficits. If we want to import, we're going to have to export. If not, we're going to have to settle our accounts with gold. And if we can't mine the gold, and, and so that is what's going to bring everything back into balance. You know, the longer we wait to do it, the more mistakes we make in the, in the interim, the harder it's going to be. And, and, and the real threat to our liberty is that this real crisis that's coming, and the economic collapse that's coming, and the financial crisis is going to be much worse than, than, than 2008. The problem is, all these problems result from government. They, wrote, they, they result from government, government meddling in the economy. All these distortions that the regulations and the subsidies and the money printing create. But the government is very successful at blaming capitalism for the problems that it creates. It, it, it mixes capitalism with socialism. And then it causes a problem. And they say, you see, capitalism doesn't work. We need more government. 
and then they get more government, then we get more problems. Well, this is going to be such an enormous problem that we might end up with total government you know, and, and completely change the fabric of our country. So I think it's very important that as many people in Congress as possible, and that's where you guys can come in, understand the root cause of these problems. And it's not because we have too much freedom and too much capitalism, but the reverse. Capitalism doesn't work uh, when government distorts it and interferes with it, when it tries to micromanage it. That's where all the problems come from. The solutions are going to be in the market. Right? It's not going to be more government. It's less government. It's rolling back all these rules and regulations that are distorting the market and returning to sound money. And if we do that, we're going to have real economic growth. We're going to have real prosperity. We might have to you know, suck it up and, and bear some pain. And just like, you know, you could taste, swallow some bitter tasting medicine. It might not taste good, but if it works, you got to do it. But, you know, denying that you're, that you're sick or just exacerbating or covering up the symptoms while you get sicker is, uh, is not the way to go. But that's unfortunately what we're doing now. Anyway, let me just uh, open it up to, to the questions. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your views on unemployment insurance and if the structure of Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's an, there's an economic truism that you're going to get more of what you subsidize, you're going to get less of what you tax. I mean, if you pay people not to work, people are going to take you up on it. You know, I mean, I did it myself. I remember the one time in my life I collected unemployment benefits, I did not look for a job until I exhausted my benefits. You know, I was in my 20s and I was living in Southern California and the weather was great and I liked the beach and I liked that better than working. And if I could get paid for lying on the beach, as long as I got enough money for gas and booze, I was, you know, it's fine with me. <laughs> and there are a lot of people today that do the same thing. I mean, it's not wrong, it's human nature. And if you can collect unemployment for two years, man, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of time on the beach. And, you know, people forget that leisure has value. I mean, you know, people would rather not work, right? People save up so they can retire. Well, you can retire early now on unemployment. And a lot of people say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, it's only $300 a week or $350 a week. Well, true, yeah. I mean, if somebody offered an unemployed person, you know, a $100,000 a year job, they'd probably take it. But what if, what if the only job they're offered is $400 a week or $500 a week? Most people won't take it. They'd rather have unemployment because it's, it's like a huge tax on getting a job. It's a, the, the highest marginal tax bracket is faced by someone who's collecting unemployment. Because not only does he have to pay taxes on what he earns, he loses all of his unemployment benefits. So the tax rate is enormous. And of course, what people forget is when you get a job, you don't get to keep all of your income. There's a lot of expenses that the IRS won't let you deduct. You know, what if the job that you get offered is, an, is you know, 45 minutes away from your house? What's it gonna cost you in gas money to get there and back? You know, and, and maybe you have to eat in a restaurant. Maybe you have to wear a suit. Maybe you have to go to a, get, you know, have a dry cleaner. Maybe you have a kid. What if you have to put your kid in daycare? How much is that going to cost? So it's so much easier just not to work. And, and so the more lucrative we make it, the more people aren't going to work. And I, I've talked to plenty of people, small businessmen, who've told me they can't find people to work. And if they find anybody, they're only willing to work if you pay them under the table. Why? Because they don't want to give up their unemployment benefits. There are people in my family right now that have told me, in my family, that are collecting unemployment. That's, what, that's their job. They don't want, you know, and you know, when I did it, when I had to do it, I actually had to go down to an unemployment office and pretend I was looking for work. And I remember, <laughs> I used to actually go, because I was afraid, you know, that the government might catch me. So I actually went and met with, I, I dropped off some resumes. I remember walking and, and, and making a little log so I can at least look like I was looking for a job. But I didn't want one. I just wanted the unemployment benefits. But I at least had to pretend that I was looking. Today you don't even have to do that. You don't, have to, you don't even have to look someone in the eye and lie. You do it all online. You can just, you can just be in South America collecting those unemployment benefits. You know, because they go a lot further. If you go down to like, you know, Costa Rica, because the, 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 the money goes a lot further if you're lying on a beach down there. So yeah, I mean, the whole thing is a racket. But you know, yeah, the politicians love it because the unemployed, yeah, extend those benefits because they'll vote for whoever extends them. And of course, part of the problem, you know, and then that's where you know, you've got all these illegal immigrants coming in. It's because who's going to take these jobs if they can get unemployment benefits? So we, I mean, we shouldn't even have uh, mandated unemployment insurance. 
I mean, if somebody wants unemployment insurance, let them buy it. I mean, you buy car insurance, you buy health insurance, you buy fire insurance. If you want to buy insurance against losing your job, just go out and buy it in the private sector. It'd be there if the government didn't provide, and at least then it would make more sense. You'd have markets setting premiums, and it, you know people people who wanted it could buy it, and you know, and it, have, it would have different incentives. It would probably pay off in a lump sum if you lost your job, you know. But now we give people all kinds of incentives uh, not to work, and of course we pass laws that make it illegal for people to work. Right? The dumbest law probably we've passed is the minimum wage law. But everybody in Congress loves it because they can pretend, oh, it's terrible. Nobody should have to work for $5 an hour, so let's make the minimum wage, you know, whatever it is, $7.50. All right, well, what does that mean? That means if you're not worth $7.50, it's illegal for you to get a job. And it's not just $7.50. Actually, you have to cover all your payroll taxes, uh, you know, other fees, mandates. And of course, there's a lot of legal liability that comes with being an employer. So an employer has to assign that value. Because the minute you hire somebody, there's a million ways you can be fined or sued. If the government doesn't like the way you're hiring people, they'll sue you. If they don't like the way they're firing people, you can be sued. All kinds. Of, so it's very risky. The government has made it very risky to hire somebody. So a lot of people make a rational decision not to hire people or to hire as few people as possible. Or if you've got to hire somebody, hire them in another country. We don't have all these liabilities. So, you know, if we got rid of that minimum wage law and we also got rid of all these unemployment benefits, a lot more Americans would have jobs. You know, how can it be? I mean, look at all the stuff that we're importing. Yet we have all these unemployed people. You know, what are the statistics? I, it's ridiculous. We import 90% of our seafood. 90% of it. We're surrounded by oceans. We've got all these lakes and we've got all these unemployed people. You don't think they can fish? I mean, you don't even just pick up a rod, go out there. But why aren't they doing it? They don't have to. Right? So we've got to get rid of all these rules and regulations that are um, making it illegal for people to work, that are making it expensive to hire people. Because people forget where jobs come from. Right? I hired a lot of people. Why did I do that? Is it because I'm a humanitarian and I just want to create jobs? No, I want to, get, I want to make as much money as possible. And I figure I can make more money if I hire people. That's the, only, that's the reason jobs are there, because somebody wanted to make money. And they hired somebody to make money. But the more difficult the government makes it, the more expensive the government makes it to hire people, the less likely it is that somebody is going to do it. I mean, if I'm going to hire people and I'm going to lose money, obviously I'm not going to do it. You know? So you have to have more profit, more opportunity. And of course, you know, the other thing that you need is, a, is capital. I mean, I can't hire workers if I don't have any tools to give them, if I don't have any equipment to give them. Where's that all coming from? That comes from savings, it comes from underinvestment, from underconsumption. Uh, you know, when they, they, the, uh, the government keeps talking about we have to raise taxes, we have to raise taxes on the wealthy because they're, they're, they're not the ones that are spending money. If we just raise taxes on the wealthy, they'll just have less money to save. Yeah, which means they have less money to invest, which means they create fewer jobs, we have, you know, a, a lower standard of living. So if, if the politicians that are, that are saying we need more jobs, if they really understood where jobs come from, they would, they would understand that they need to reduce the regulations and reduce the taxes on the people that create those jobs. Yeah. One argument that I've heard over and over again about a gold standard is there's not enough gold for all the money that we've printed. Do you have a rebuttal to that? Well, not at this price there's not. The gold price is just going to have to go up, that's all. But the idea that there's not enough gold in the world is ludicrous. It doesn't matter how much gold there is. Uh, it, prices are just going to adjust to the, to the level of gold that, that exists. Money needs to be scarce. That's what makes it valuable. If it was plentiful, if there was, if there was all the gold that we needed, then it would have no value. What makes it rare and valuable is that it's scarce. And if you look at historically, the gold supply increases by maybe 1 or 2% a year. That's it. That's pretty predictable, pretty consistent. And it works great. I mean, we had the Industrial Revolution on a gold standard. People that say the economy can't grow on a gold standard, our economy grew more on a gold standard than since we left it. If you look at the standard of living of the average American from, let's say, um, 1800 to 1900, and compare the way the average American lived and the way he lived at the end of that century, and then compare that to the changes that have made since we've been on the fiat standard, it's a much bigger difference. You know, the standard of living grew a lot faster. And imagine how much wealthier society would be, how much less we would all be working, how much more prosperity and leisure we would all enjoy if we had continued on the gold standard for the 20th century. Instead, we went off it and we sacrificed a lot of economic growth in the process. 
Yeah. Um, if, if you operate on the assumption that Washington, writ large, keeps doing basically what it's been doing, rather than do the right thing and things just progress the way they continue to progress, how do you see events unfolding? I mean, obviously, you alluded to a larger financial crisis, but how, how is that going to man how would that manifest itself in a world where you've got a Ben Bernanke and members of Congress who are determined to do their best not to let nature take its course? Yeah, well, you know, eventually it just has to happen just because the numbers are so large. Uh, you know, we, we've got, you know, just like the people who were buying houses using a, a teaser rate on a subprime mortgage, the problem was the teaser rates expired and, you know, they couldn't afford the higher payments. Well, we've got the same thing. I think about 40% of the national debt matures in the next year. That's a lot of money. I mean, that's, what, $6 trillion, something, I don't know the exact amount. But it's two to three times what the government collects in taxes. How can we possibly pay that off? Well, we can't. And the idea is that we don't have to because we're just going to borrow the money. Well, that's the same idea that Bernie Madoff had. And it worked for a while for Bernie, but it didn't work forever. You know, we're not going to be able to constantly roll this debt over. Not at, you know, near 0% interest. Eventually, our creditors are going to want to get paid. And we can't pay. And, and then we're, going to, you know, we're not going to have the crisis until it's, until it's forced on. We're not going to do the right thing until there's a crisis, right? So we're not going to preempt it. But we had this phony crisis when we had the debt ceiling crisis, when we refused to raise the debt ceiling. The real crisis is when the lenders won't, won't, won't raise the lending ceiling. And in fact, we actually admitted to our creditors, you know, the mess of, you know, how much trouble they're in, because we said, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to default. That's what we told them. We told them that we're running a Ponzi scheme. We didn't say that if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to raise taxes so we can pay our debt, or we're going to cut Social Security spending or military spending so that we can honor our commitments. We said if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we can't borrow more money, we're not going to pay off the people that we borrowed money from. So we told, the, you know, we told our creditors that they're the little man on the totem pole. So they already know this, but at some point, they're not going to be buying this debt. The Chinese are going to wake up. They're going to stop buying this. I mean, people think that the Chinese are, are going to throw good money after bad indefinitely, that you know, they've got $2 trillion in treasuries, and that's, they can't afford to lose, so they're going to keep buying. Well, pretty soon they're not going to be thinking about the $2 trillion they have, but the 5 or $10 trillion that they're going to buy if they don't stop. And, and you know, might as well lose money on $2 trillion than lose money on 10. So at some point, they're going to wake up, and, you know, and, and, and of course, their economy is going to boom. The minute they stop doing this, that's the biggest irony, is you have American politicians beating up on China for manipulating their currency. But the, beneficiaries, the, the benefactors of that policy are not the Chinese, it's the Americans. We get to buy stuff for cheap. We, get to, we have all this stuff that the Chinese are sacrificing. If the R&B went up, the Chinese would be buying all this stuff, not us. They would get to have the fruits of their labor instead of just the labor. You know, and we, and, and we get the fruits. Now, long term, the Chinese aren't doing us a favor because they're helping to undermine our economy. But in the short run, you know, we have a higher standard of living because it's financed on the backs of people in China working in factories and, and, and not getting the full benefit of what they produce. But the, where the crisis is going to come, we can't borrow any more money. And the Federal Reserve has to print. They have to do QE3 or QE4, whatever they're calling it at the time, or maybe they won't call it anything. They'll just do it. But, and then prices really start to rise much faster. I mean, I know prices are rising for food, for energy. Look, I just got my, my health insurance premiums from last year, and then my initial increase was 19%. Now, I had to shop it around to get my increase down to 12%, but that's just in one year for the same coverage. You know, but it's not. It's, how, it's college tuitions are going up. I mean, prices are going up. I mean, the only place that they're not going up is in the CPI. I wish I could buy the CPI. But unfortunately, I have to buy real things. And, and they're getting more expensive. But at some point, they're going to get a lot more expensive. And the government's not going to be able to pretend it doesn't exist. And, you know, the dollar's just going to collapse. I mean, Europe is, you know, right now, Europe is temporarily buying us some time. But it's going to be very expensive time uh, because it's enabling us to go deeper and deeper into debt. But again, where is this debt going? It's going to finance more government. The government bubble is worse than the housing bubble. It's worse than the dot-com bubble. Because at least in the dot-com bubble, we got a couple of companies that had value. 
At least the housing bubble, we got houses. We might have spent too much money on them, but they're there. You know, the crazy thing is guys like Alan Greenspan argued for burning them. He wanted to destroy them so we would have, so we would have no benefit whatsoever from the housing bubble. At least we got houses, right? But there's, what are we getting from the government bubble? We get anything, you know, more bureaucrats. I mean, we're getting more consumption, more spending. So this is the biggest bubble of them all. And it is going to unravel. And, you know, the question is, what's going to happen? When the dollar really starts to collapse and prices start spiraling out of control, what are we going to do? Are we going to do what Nixon did? Are we going to put on wage and price controls? We probably won't need wage controls because wages probably won't be going up. That's the one price that probably won't rise. But the price of everything else is going to go up, which is going to be particularly problematic. You know, a lot of economists, they make the the incorrect assumption that you can't have inflation without rising wages. Well, yeah, you can. It's just a lot more painful when the wages don't go up. Uh, but employment costs go up. Maybe not wages, but other costs associated with employment. But people working you know, doesn't create inflation. In fact, people working helps bring prices down. It's people not working that help make prices go up. Because prices are a function not just of, of demand, but of supply. And people working create supply. Right? When they're not working, you have less supply. And also what happens is when the dollar crashes, right, supply of goods in America goes down because we can't import to, afford to import. In addition, we export less. So what happens is capacity comes down. And you can see that now in the airlines. Right? The airlines are raising prices even though fewer people are flying. How are they doing that? Because they're reducing capacity. And they're going to have to reduce it a lot more. And air prices are going to rise dramatically in the, few, in the next few years, even though fewer people are going to fly. Fewer people are going to fly, but they're going to play, pay a lot more. Same thing is going to happen. We're starting to export more refined gasoline now. That's more and more of that's going to happen. So even though Americans are going to be using less gas, they're going to pay a lot more for the gas they use. Because the supply is going to be less. Because a lot of the gas that used to be here is going to be filling up a car in China. And that's going to be even more dramatic once the Chinese RMB goes up. You know, once the Chinese let their currency go up, everything goes on sale in China. So the Chinese buy more of everything. Well, where are they getting all this stuff? It's the stuff that we used to buy, but that we can't afford anymore. Because when the prices go down for the Chinese, they go up for Americans. So this, this whole collapse is coming. And if we want to do anything about it, we have to recognize right, what, what, the, what the fault is. And then we have to start dealing with the real cause of the problem, which is the big government, all the regulations, all the taxes, all the spending. And we can't just talk about cutting taxes. We gotta cut spending. That's the tax. Right? The cost of government is measured by what it spends, not what it taxes. Because it, all government spending has to be paid for, one way or another. And either they're gonna pay for it through taxation or through inflation. Now temporarily they can borrow, but that either means they're gonna have to raise taxes in the future or raise inflation in the future. So ultimately, they can either tax or inflate, but that's it. So that's the cost. So when people talk about, hey, we cut your taxes, but they have these huge deficits, they haven't cut our taxes at all. Right? If government is more expensive, right, we're paying more to support it, one way or another. The politicians can lie about it right, when, they, when they run a deficit, but ultimately we're going to have to pay. So we're going to have to shrink that government dramatically if we're ever going to get out from under this mess. Because the only reason this phony economy works now is because we can borrow the money to sustain it. Because the world will take our paper for their stuff. But when that stops, America, we can't function. This economy cannot function with this level of bureaucracy. You know, we're going to have to we're going to have to make some deep rooted changes, and they're obviously going to have to come from from this you know here. Yeah. Uh, kind of a two part question. Uh, first. Um, it's good that the Austrian school is starting to get more attention nowadays, but for a long time uh, it was more in the public view, mm -hmm. uh, a sort of intellectual battle between Keynesians and the mm -hmm. Chicago school. So uh, what do you say to the suggestion that um, the Chicago school uh, could be very, very dangerous because they essentially preach free market except when it comes to currency and debt? and then when something goes wrong, the Keynesians say, well, look, the free market doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, it's a bad, you know, it's, it's a bad comparison, you know, say, you know, you, know you, you give capitalism a bad name when you preach it, but don't really practice it. That's, that's what happened. I think that, you know, you really have to start to look at the Austrians who, you know, have a much better explanation for what's happened and a much better understanding. But, you know, the problem is, and the reason 
that Keynesianism is so popular you know, here on the Hill is it's exactly what the politicians want. The Keynes gives them a reason to do what they want to do anyway. To just, you know, because it's so easy to just spend government money. And if, and if you can argue that that's going to grow the economy. And of course, you know, where you can often, you know, destroy their arguments. Like they're, they're saying we have to extend unemployment benefits because it's going to help the economy. And how is it going to help the economy? They say, well, because the unemployed people are going to spend the money. Well, if just printing up money and giving it to people to spend grew the economy, why just limit it to the unemployed? Why not give the benefits to everybody? Then we'd have even more growth. And, if, and, if, and, if, and if, why not double the unemployment benefits? Then we'll get double the growth. Why not triple it, quadruple it? You know, why not give everybody a million dollars? No. And, and of course, at some point, they're going to say, well, that's too much. Well, then what about if we do a dollar less? Is that too much? So you, it, it never works. Because whatever money the government gives the unemployed, it has to take it from someplace else. The government has nothing. All it does is redistribute. And so it's not going to help the economy. It's going to hurt the economy. You know, a, apart from the fact that it's, it's subsidizing people not to work, and so the economy is deprived of the labor and the output that otherwise would have accompanied that work. Instead, somebody is idle. But when you transfer money around, you're, you're, you're lessening economic growth. The deficits that we create to pay those unemployment benefits are going to do more damage to the economy than whatever benefit you get from spending those unemployment checks. You know? So it's, it's, it's easy to, to, to critique that, but the, the, the Keynesian view is the more politically popular. And that is the problem. Everything that we need to do, all the things that are good for the economy, are bad politics. And everything that's you know, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, bad for the economy is good politics. You know? Even among a lot of the people who understand that government is the problem, you know, it's still, a lot of them still, you know, want their Social Security benefits. They, they want a lot of stuff from government. And they don't realize that the government doesn't have the money. Yeah. I think we, we've gone over time, so I don't want to keep people here who, who need to go. But if there are more questions that want to be, that you want to ask, please feel free to stay. All right. So <clears throat> when this, uh, this collapse does occur, is there any country around the world that will fare better? Or how will America fare relative to other companies? Yeah, I think the, the countries that have the most to gain are the countries that are bearing the lion's share of the burden of supporting us. So if you look at the countries that are amassing enormous foreign exchange reserves, particularly in dollars, countries that have these huge sovereign wealth funds, these are the countries that have the most to gain because they are you know, paying the lion's share of the subsidy. This is what America gets a huge subsidy. A lot of people will be able to conceive that Americans live beyond their means. Right? We, we buy a lot of things. Uh, that we didn't produce, we, we borrow and we spend. So we live beyond our means. Well, that's only possible because other people are content to live beneath their means. Well, the people who have been living beneath their means, when they don't do that anymore, they're going to see big gain. And so, you know, when, let's say, the Chinese, for example, when they allow their currency to rise, all of a sudden uh, the Chinese are going to be able to afford to buy a lot of things that today are out of their price range. And so the Chinese are going to see a big increase in their standard of living. At the same time, we're going to see a corresponding decline in ours because now you know, we're not going to have those things. And if an American wants to buy something made in China, maybe he's going to have to pay three or four or five times as much money. You know? And then as an ind individual, is there anything you can do to lessen the blow for yourself? Well, yeah. I mean, as an individual, you can recognize that the dollar is going to lose value, and so you don't save dollars. And that's part of the problem. right? You know, we need savings to grow the economy, yet, but you'd have to be a fool to save dollars. So therefore, we can't get the savings that we need if we're chasing capital out of the country. But you can buy gold, you can buy silver, you can, you can invest overseas, you can have foreign currencies, you can have stocks abroad in the economies that are going to improve when you know, this dollar at the center of the global monetary system comes to an end. You know, this is the problem. We, we have polluted the entire global economy. We export our bad monetary policy because the dollar is the reserve currency. Everybody is trying to maintain a parity, a relationship with the dollar. But instead of being a force for good and stability, we're a force for instability and, and, and recklessness because it's a race to the bottom, right? And, uh, and so it's disrupting the entire global economy. We are the, at the epicenter of these massive global imbalances that are the real root cause of the problems and the booms and the busts. But you know, when that ends, you know, the world you know, collectively can breathe a sigh of relief. But it's going to be very difficult in America 
uh, to get used to actually having to live within our means, because then we're going to have to acknowledge how dramatically our means has been diminished over the years. And as I said earlier, if we're going to restore our, you know, you know, our economy, we can't do it with all this government. I mean, we never could have produced the wealth that we once had if we had all this government. And it's the absence of government that allows us to be productive. It's, it's freedom. That's what we need. If we, want to, if we want to help people, we need to give them more opportunity and more freedom. And we're not going to get that by, by passing laws. Right? We get that by repealing laws. Yeah. Oh, I thought you just raised your hand. Oh, it was you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about convertibility because sort of the American history textbook explanation for us leaving the gold standard was that other countries particularly France, converted en masse our debt into gold. Um, can the United States, if we go through sort of a more organized default, rather than letting the market you know, tear us apart, um, be the only economy that switches back to the gold standard if, if there's that risk of convertibility? If, if the dollar skyrockets, how will we export? Well, just the, well, the way we exported before. I mean, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean if you have a strong currency, it doesn't mean you can't export. In fact, if you have a strong currency, it diminishes your capital costs. You have more savings. You have more investment. It diminishes your uh, raw material costs. It makes the imported components less expensive. It means you don't have to give uh, wages because your workers are getting wages just in, in, in higher purchasing power. They don't need a, a nominal increase. So uh, there are a lot of benefits. But yeah, I mean, if we were to be proactive and admit right now, okay, the country is broke and let's restructure on our own terms. Let's figure out, you know, you know what we have to do. Because as I said, we need higher interest rates, right? That is the, the only way we're going to solve the problem. But we have to acknowledge that if we give in, if we let interest rates go up, you know, this whole phony thing collapses, which of course is a good thing. Because the sooner it collapses, the sooner we can rebuild something real in its place. But everybody is so afraid of the short-term consequences that they want to postpone it as long as possible, which means it's not going to be on our own terms. It's going to be a, a, a crisis that hits us from abroad. If we do it ourselves, if we preempt, it's still going to be painful, but it's not going to be as painful. And we'll, it, it'll, it'll be a lot better. And of course, a lot of the pain, it's not going to be uniform. The pain is going to be felt principally on the people who are living off of government. The people who are getting a check from the government are going to have to get smaller checks, or in some cases, no checks at all. We're going to remove the burden off the backs of the American public. So it's not going to talk about austerity. Okay, austerity for who? Right? Not the people paying the bills, the people living, you know, the people riding in the wagon are going to have to have some austerity. Not the people pulling it, they're going to get some relief, which is what they need. But you know, some of the things that we could do as far as getting government out of the way will have such immediate benefits, right? If we got the government out of education and out of student loans, tuitions would plummet. All of a sudden, college wouldn't be a, such an insurmountable expense. Families wouldn't have to worry about saving for college because it wouldn't be that expensive. And maybe not all their kids would go. I mean, now everybody goes to college even if you have no aptitude for it whatsoever. What's the point? What's the point of sending a kid to college so we can you know, party it up for five years, get drunk, you know, and then graduate, you know, with a lot of debt and, you know, no skills, no knowledge. Um, if we get government out of health care and, you know, all of a sudden medical costs collapse, I mean, isn't that going to be a good thing if it doesn't cost so much to go to the doctor? It doesn't cost so much if you get sick. So there are a lot of things that you just get government out of the way and you get free market efficiencies in. You get an immediate benefit. Now, who does that hurt? Well, yes, someone's going to hurt when tuitions come down. Some overpaid administrators at universities are going to earn less money. Oh, well. You know, and some people working in universities are going to lose their jobs. Okay, well, they didn't need those jobs, so they'll have to do something productive. And if they do something productive, we're all going to benefit. You know, the more people employed productively, everybody benefits from that productivity. The more people that we have doing things that they shouldn't be doing because of some government subsidy, we're all made poor as a result. So it's not going to take that long. If we do all the right things, it's like ripping off a band-aid. If you just rip it off, it doesn't really hurt that much. You know? But if you peel it off slowly, you know, then it hurts. So if we just get rid of all this government and, and, and bring back freedom, it's, we're not, there's not going to be a lot of suffering that long. Some people, sure. You know, people who, who thought they were going to retire on Social Security, okay, well, they're going to find out that that's not going to happen. They got to work. They got to save their money. But they're not going to get Social Security anyway. 
So why don't we, you know, let's, let's deal with that now instead of paying them off in worthless money. I mean, what good is that going to be? Because that's the end result. But the, the, not only don't the politicians have the integrity to do the right thing, most of them don't even know what the right thing is. Right? So hopefully if we can educate people, there's got to be somebody in Congress other than Ron Paul right, that actually cares about the country. And, and, and you know, a lot of times when the congressmen will think, well, I can't do that. I mean, it's too big of a risk. Well, what's the risk? That you don't get reelected? I mean, what's so terrible about that? You know, there are people that, are, that risk their lives on a battlefield for the country. You can't risk not getting reelected? I mean, big deal. So people have to understand, you know. And this is, you know, this is a very pivotal point in our history.